Britain offers to slaughter 15,000 cattle a week for the next five years to wipe out BSE. More people have fallen ill with a stomach bug that's thought to have been caused by drinking contaminated water. The number of suspected food poisoning cases in central Scotland has risen to 181. 91 of these are confirmed as having been killed by Why do governments make laws about things that affect our health? Today, government controls the safety of the food we eat, the water we drink, and the houses we live in. The government sees our health as an important part of its job, but in the past, Governments did not see health as their responsibility. Why did things change? How is she? How do you feel, Annie? It's just said seven. She was fine at dawn. She's sweating, but she's cold. Is this what she's passed? It's white. Susan, look at it. What, what do you think it is? Do you know what it is? Shut up! Just shut up! She's squinting. It's nothing. I'll never speak to you. I'll not have my girl go in that van, do you hear me? I might as well put her in a hearse. I'll put her in a box half naked. With the blankets left from the last one. She goes in that van, she's never coming back. Do you want me to stay? Just keep the kids out. They're down by the river. Just keep them out till it's over. In the cellar of number 23, Back Irk Street, Anne Hannah, eight-year-old daughter of an unemployed weaver, was dying because of the cholera epidemic that had hit the poorest parts of the city. We know about Anne because of a local doctor, Henry Galter. He wrote a book about the cholera epidemic, which gave us a detailed picture of working life in Manchester in 1832. We had known the disease was coming. It had swept across Europe like a, like an enemy no army could hold back. It was in London, Belfast, Liverpool, Glasgow. We knew it would not pass us by. So two months ago our Board of Health inspected the poorest parts of the town. And what we found there, such scenes of filth, crowding, disgusting habits, drunkenness, and in some districts such wretchedness and hunger. So much that when the report was finally published, many of our more comfortable citizens said that we'd slurred the good name of the city for painting a picture quite so grim. As the epidemic spread, Galter plotted the first 200 cases on a map, and he visited the families involved to question them to try to pin down the cause of the disease. He knew that cholera affected poor people more than it affected rich people. In Back Irk Street, three days after the death of Anne Hannah, he found her younger sister Margaret was sick too. Margaret Hannah, aged four, very delicate, half famished, seized Monday, July 23rd, 7 a.m. I'm sorry to ask these questions at such a time, you understand? No, she'd not been with her sister. Not when Anne was sick. But no, it was too quick. Margaret were out playing at the time. Uh, and then in the afternoon, they came for her, for Anne. Took her to the hospital. Don't know who told them. It was for the best. 
So, Margaret never saw her sister again. No contact, then. Has she eaten? Margaret. My husband's not worked these two months. If I have food, it goes to me eldest. I gave Anne porridge the night before she went, and buttermilk. And now I see that we're wasted. Margaret's had nothing. No one at this stage knew exactly what caused cholera. Some people thought it was contagious, but you caught it from other people. But people like Galter had made the connection between cholera and the poor conditions in which these people lived their lives. The poor quality of the food they ate, the overcrowded housing and the bad sanitation. Many of the streets Galter found cholera victims in were streets of back-to-back -back houses. Many doctors believed these houses were the cause of diseases like cholera because they believed bad air was trapped in them. In fact, the real problem was the lack of running water, drains, lavatories and refuse collection. This house, for instance, number six, Jordan Street. It's blocked in from the side and the rear. There's only one source of air and light. The rubbish they have to carry through the house to the front, but because the streets are so narrow, the rubbish carts can't fit, so the filth just sits there. The distance here, yeah, look, between two facing houses is just 14 foot. Each house had just two rooms, one up, one down. And the cellars, some of which were as small as 12 foot by 14, the landlords rented out separately to make even more money. I have seen whole families, six, seven, eight, sleeping on the floor, no furniture, in one cellar. The children, half naked, half starved, and the smell, it's, yeah, it's indescribable. Where is the privy? Down by the bridge. And how many people use it? 80? 100? And what sort is it? Is it a hole in the ground or does it overhang the river? A hole. And how often do they come up to take away the filth? Or does it overflow? The problem was that until 1830 in Manchester, builders could build what they liked. There were no building regulations. Workers were flooding in from the countryside to the towns and they needed somewhere to live. The builders wanted to make maximum profits, so they built back-to-backs to cram more and more people into less and less space. These local maps show the speed of development. In 1794, Back Irk Street didn't exist. The area was mainly fields. Over the next 40 years, by 1831, the fields have become narrow streets and courts. How long have you been here? Two months. Our, um, our village were being cleared. They gave us free passage on a barge once we'd left the pull down our cottage. Did you know what to expect? Work. And did you find work? Susan took me to the foreman. I am lucky. I've got small hands, you know, for the spindles. So you stay here with Susan? She has a husband and the children. It, it would not be right. I, I, I am in uh, lodgings across the way. First it scared me, you know, sleeping with strangers, but now they don't seem so strange. Men and women? No. No, it, it is a decent house. Well, not like some. But Mrs Hopkins has seven men and women in the one room and not the same surname between them. You have done well. Throughout Britain, over 31,000 people died in this cholera epidemic, 900 of them in Manchester. 
Most of them lived in houses like this, built next to stables, slaughterhouses, factories. Because there were no building regulations, builders weren't forced to provide sewers, toilets or water supplies. Many poorer families had to collect water from canals or rivers. People even stole water from private water pumps, then used it so sparingly that it became even dirtier. Over 30 years later, by 1867, it was accepted that the cholera germ was in the water, something Henry Galton never knew. But his work helped to prove the link between disease and poor living conditions. It seems to me, when you examine the conditions of our working poor, that the truly remarkable question is why so few should have died. Walk down Back Irk Street, for instance, and note how outside the very door of number 23, in which house Anne and Margaret Hannah died, the sewer bubbles up through the crumbling masonry, flooding the street in a stinking mass of excrement. Now, is this not the perfect soil in which disease would grow? Frankly, I can see no reason, all things considered, why we should have escaped quite so lightly. Do we need government help to make us lead healthy lives? This question was argued over for most of the 19th century. Some people believed that things would sort themselves out. It was up to individuals to look after themselves. Others believed that the government had to take more control of health matters. This drawing was made in 1840 and shows one person's view of life for poor children at the time. The medical problems were serious. In 1842, a report by Edwin Chadwick showed that death rates were extremely high. The average life expectancy for the working classes in Manchester was 17. A rich person could expect to live twice as long. Manchester had been one of the first places to bring in local acts to improve things. All streets are to be at least 24 feet wide and paved and drained by their owners. Of course, it didn't affect the many streets already built, like Back Irk Street. It could only affect new building. Back-to-back -back housing was cheap to build because only one thin wall of brick separated any two houses. In 1844, building back-to-backs was made illegal in Manchester, but we know they were still being built ten years later. This report was made by visiting inspectors from the Manchester and Salford Sanitary Association. They were looking at the street next to Back Irk Street. There is new property at the top of Silver Street in no better condition. The houses are newly built and back to back. In these records, the name of the owner has been crossed through. But we can still see it says the property belongs to Alderman Pilling. Alderman Pilling was a member of the local council. It looks as if someone was trying to prevent this information from being made public. In 1848, the government responded to public and official pressure by passing a public health act. But most of its provisions were not compulsory, so many councils didn't do anything. Magazines of the time printed cartoons like this one, showing the local councillors as pigs, ignoring the government's orders out of greed. Many of the middle classes believed that the poor people were responsible for the diseases they caught. They didn't accept that the local councils should try to improve the health of the poor. In 1853, Manchester Council tried to make it illegal to have people living in cellar dwellings, but the landlords opposed the measure. This would mean closing nearly all the cellar dwellings and would cause many of us to lose a great deal of income. Some of us would be ruined. Also, it would be very bad for the tenants, as they would have nowhere else to live. The landlords were right. Closing slums did cause problems. Around Back Irk Street, some of the houses were demolished when the railway line came through, as we can see from this map of 1839. 
the housing left got even more overcrowded. This engraving was made by a Frenchman, Gustave Doré, who visited Britain in the 19th century and was amazed at the overcrowding he witnessed. Ten years after the demolitions, in 1849, the Morning Chronicle sent a reporter to Manchester. His report and these images give us some idea of the conditions. The flicker of the candle showed grimy walls reeking with fetid damp which trickled in greasy drops down to the floor. Beds were huddled in every corner. One man was too drunk to get rid of his trousers. In the next cellar slept two boys and a man. One man was lying dressed and beside him a well-grown calf. Sitting upon another bed was an old man, maudlin drunk, with saliva running over his chin. In one of the walls was a little hollow, six feet long, two deep and one high. The death rates were as high as ever. Many people agreed that something had to be done. The next 11 years was a time of much greater action on health reform. In the later 19th century, attitudes changed. Britain became more wealthy through trade and industry. It seemed possible to do more for the people. Manchester finally appointed a medical officer of health in 1867. His name was John Lee. He wanted to get rid of cellar dwellings, get rid of back-to-backs, and get rid of midden privies. We can see how successful he was by looking at the documents that still survive from that time. The rate books for Manchester tell us that cellars were still lived in in 1872. By 1873, all the dwellings are listed as houses. People were no longer living in cellars. Midden privies were literally holes in the ground. The filth had to be dug out, which made it very difficult to remove properly. John Lee brought in a system of pale closets. When people went to the toilet, the waste now went into a bucket beneath the seat, which could be easily removed. Bad housing could not be cured so quickly. These houses were still being lived in in 1944, when this photo was taken. But gradually, houses were demolished throughout the later part of the 19th century. All new streets had to be wide enough so that a cart could get access to the outside toilet, in order to take the waste away. In 1875, the second major public health act was passed. This time, it was not voluntary. All local authorities were legally obliged to bring in reforms. The act was enforced. All local authorities in Britain had to appoint medical officers. Over the next 20 years, housing, water supplies and drainage improved. But the reforms were not aimed at curing poverty. Disease and ill health continued to be major problems for the working classes. There is very little film from the beginning of this century, but this was shot in 1946 to show the Victorian conditions that still existed, 75 years after the reforms. Published by the local authorities all over the country. Poverty meant that people had to carry on living in very unhealthy conditions. Poverty also meant that people ate cheap food. Tea, bread and margarine were the main foods of the poor. Poor people could not afford to eat the kind of food that provided vitamins, minerals and enough calories to protect them from illness. Keeping clean was still difficult where some 7,000 people are still living in slum conditions. The effect of poverty on health was still very obvious. Council records show an increase in death rates amongst very young children. The home of Drake, of whom she is justly proud. In 1840, 144 out of every 1,000 babies had died. By 1899, it had gone up to 163 babies in a 1,000 who died before the age of one. By now, working people were beginning to get organised into groups which demanded changes. 
There were many different political and workers groups. One of these was the Women's Cooperative Guild. The Guild was set up in 1883. It was one of the first organised women's groups and fought for government action in health matters, such as maternity care for pregnant women, childcare, free school meals for the poor and cleaner streets and housing. Meetings were held all over the country. This is what one member of the Guild wrote. We were taught about vaccinations and death rates. One speaker told us about the public health laws and showed us how the water supply got polluted. After this, we sent up a list of questions to the local health committee. The mayor wasn't very happy about us asking for information, but in the end, he was forced to answer our questions. The British Empire also needed many more able-bodied people. The government wanted to send fit, healthy men to administer the empire. And the armed forces wanted to see health measures brought in. Because during the Boer War, fought from 1899 to 1902, many recruits had not been fit for service. In Manchester, for example, out of 9,000 recruits, only 1,000 were fit for service. As a result of this concern, a parliamentary report was published in 1904. This report asked the government to get rid of overcrowded housing, control smoke pollution, give school children regular medical inspections, set up day nurseries for the children of working mothers and stop selling tobacco to children. The massive concern from all sections of society meant that the 1906 Liberal government passed new laws. The kinds of laws that had never been passed before to give poor people help. 1906, school meals were provided for needy children. 1907, schools had to give medicals to children. All births had to be notified to the health visitor. 1908, old age pensions were paid. 1909, the building of back-to-back -back housing was banned across Britain. When the housebreakers take charge, you can really see how rotten these places are. At the beginning of the 19th century, there was little government interference in health matters. By the beginning of the 20th, there was a lot. People began to accept that poverty might be the cause of disease. They also began to accept that poor people could not be blamed for poverty. Today, the government takes responsibility for the nation's health. But the arguments about how much the government should interfere continue. How much government intervention do we need to make us lead healthy lives? <laughs>